Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Beginning in the 7th verse, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to find that. That's 1 Corinthians 4, 7, and we're going to read down through verse 14. And this all has to do with Jesus the Messiah. One who comes to this earth and makes a difference, a way, a purpose, power, and place. Certainly an appropriate psalm for the sermon as well. That's 1 Corinthians 4, 7 through 14. In 1946, World War II was barely over, and the Middle East was just beginning to settle back into its usual way of being. And in that period of time, there was a young man who was a shepherd, and he was out with his sheep down near the area of the Dead Sea. Why you take your sheep there, I don't know. But apparently there is something to graze there, and only sheep will eat it. So that's where he was, and apparently he lost a sheep, just like the Bible story. And he was out looking for this sheep, and he was crawling around the cliffs, around the Dead Sea, that barren, dirty, dry place with only salt, nasty salt water to drink. And he's looking for that sheep, and there's a cave. He comes upon a cave, and in order to see if there's anything down there, he throws a rock, hoping if there's a sheep, it'll disturb it, it'll make a noise, he'll go down to get it. So he threw a rock, and what he heard was the crash of pottery. <coughs> the sound of a clay pot being crushed and broken. And even though he was searching for a sheep, he was just curious enough to crawl down into that cave and to see what it was. And when he got there, he found a cluster of clay pots of the kind that they used in Jesus' day to store grain. It's kind of cylindrical, maybe two, two and a half feet tall, has a little lid like a bowl that sits over the top. It's the kind of thing that they use to store grain and to keep it safe. And as he found these pots, there was no grain but there were little shards of parchment and papyrus, and it had markings on it. And so this young guy, illiterate, picked some of it up, and he carried it out with him. And he took it back home when he finally got back with his sheep. And someplace, he found a dealer in antiquities and sold them for a few cents. And for a year or two, nothing happened. And then finally, a scholar came across them. He bought them. And he realized what he had were fragments of the Old Testament written on ancient, ancient mediums in an ancient, ancient script. And the whole world blew apart. People were looking for that source. They were looking for that cave. And they had to go find it again. Of course, the young guy had been there once, but he couldn't go back. And so for a year or two, they searched and searched until they finally found that and they took this treasure trove of ancient texts out of it. We know them as the Dead Sea Scrolls. For 10 years, they searched and searched to make sure that they had gotten everything. They searched all the surrounding caves and other places. At that time, in ancient times, in the time of Jesus, a group by the name of the Essenes, a monastic type people, lived there. And they produced many of these texts, but most of them were much older than the Essenes themselves. And they had stored them in these caves because the Romans were coming to destroy the entire kingdom. They hid them in these caves. And so those texts were taken out and they were taken to the, the university, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and they were kept in complete isolation. Nobody was finding out what was in there. The security was super high. Nothing was taken in, no information was taken out. And so for years and years and years, there was all sorts of speculation. You know how there is in a situation like that? There's speculation about what was in there. And people were saying, you know, this is going to totally disprove the Bible. All you Christians are going to lose your faith because it's going to be shown that none of the things in your Old Testament actually happened. You see, there, there uh, is a world out there that tries to explain everything away. You know how um, the theory of evolution came about that it was applied to biology, that it, life just happened to happen, and it developed one step at a time, and that it became more and more complex, and, and so we have the world we see today. That same philosophy was used by Marx and Engels when they came up with the, the, the idea of communism. And they were saying, well, the evolution of politics works like this. You start with these 
I'm by myself, and you could organize it into a kingdom with one person on top, and then you develop things like democracy, and there's a little more freedom. But finally, it's going to end up in its culmination, which is communism, where it's the whole world lives in equality and plenty, and everybody's happy. Right. That same theory of evolution was applied to understanding the Bible. And they came up with what they called the day the e peer theory. Day the e p theory. Part of that. I don't remember what the acronym stands for. But the idea was, well, there were all these religious thoughts. People got together, they compared those, they compiled them together, they edited it out, until finally we arrived with what we know and know the Bible today. It just happened to happen. See. And those scholars just knew that when we got into those uh, documents that came from the Dead Sea, we would see that, oh, there's the roots. We could see how it all came together. And it doesn't mean anything. See, one of the great challenges to the faith was that the oldest Old Testament documents we had were, were barely a thousand years old, even now. The Masoretic texts, they call them, there was a Jewish group called the Masoretes, and their job. And their vision was to pass down those Old Testament uh, documents. They copied them by hand, and they're almost identical, one after another, one after another, one after another. But they're not very ancient. How do we know what the ancient texts are? As they began to publish these texts, it was an amazing thing. An amazing thing. These old texts, many of them 1,400 years older than the Masoretic texts, hardly any different at all. A little scratch, a little line, a little variation in the letter, and the style of the writing. And they had been tricked. The, the Old Testament had been handed down person to person almost perfectly. Among those texts was a copper roll. And when they unfolded, when they got it straightened out, the book of Isaiah. The entire book of Isaiah on a hammered sheet of copper marked with a stylus after all those generations, they found it to be true. The same thing that we have now is the same thing that they had then. Amazing. What a treasure in jars of clay. These humble storage devices, a grain bin, held the key to understanding what God had passed down to us. Held the key to knowing that, that we could trust this Bible we have because it has remained the same all these years. It didn't just develop. It didn't change. It's what God has given us and that we have received it again today. A powerful thing. Now, a little side note. You would think that this discovery would have finished the argument. No. no. We just found some other reasons to think what we were thinking before. Oh, well, that's the people. That's who we are. That's what we do. We just back up and dig a little deeper. That's all. But the idea that we have these things in this jar of clay strikes at my heart. The scripture I'm going to read today, because we are those jars as well. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. We have this treasure, talking about Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not pressed, perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is, in that, is at work in us, but life is at work in us. In you. Some years back, a man by the name of John Orthberg wrote a book that came out as a study. We used it in Sunday school, and the name of the study was Everybody's Normal Until You Get to Know Them. <laughs> we understand what he's saying, don't we? People are people. And we can seem smooth on the surface kind and gentle, but in moments of stress, when troubles come, when there's conflict, it peels back a layer in us, and that childish part of us tends to come out and express itself in socially unacceptable ways, you might say. 
Sometimes it's not pretty. They find their way out at the most inconvenient moments, too. When the baby awakes for the third time in the middle of the night, when something goes wrong at work, in a meeting at church where things run a little high and emotions are a little uh, uh, powerful for us, and it gets away from us, from us. Sometimes it's when our son is called for a foul that we know he didn't do. What's wrong with that guy? Away with the zebras, we say. Sometimes the words that come out. And then we turn and go, where'd that come from? We know where it came from. Really. We know. We know that it's there. The frustration, the fearful situation, the faithlessness of another, or as we see it, or our own foolishness, we know it's there. Because we're really... Play, but we're cracked pots, literally. We are damaged because of who we are and what we have been. We want to be strong. We want to be confident in ourselves and know that we're sufficient for every situation. We want to be people worthy of honor and respect by those that are around us. We want people to hear us and understand us and believe us just because of who we are. But there's this thing in us, this thing in us that is a crack in our armor. 